Welcome to the Hard to Kill Podcast, the go-to podcast for military, LEO, and EMS professionals, sharing ideas and experiences from around the world to make you hard to kill. Here's your host, Dave Morrow. Welcome, ladies and gents. Uh, sitting here with Tim and Ben. And uh, so this is an interesting little uh, little encounter because uh, Instagram, again, has uh, put me in contact with some, uh, some awesome human beings. Um, Tim and Ben are obviously two of them. And uh, we're going to be chatting a little bit about their, um, their experience in the Canadian Armed Forces and uh, discussing mindset and just everything it took for them to get to the level that they did in their career. So Tim, Ben, uh, it's an honor to have you on the podcast. And uh, so I guess, uh, Tim, uh, why don't you uh, start first and uh, give us a little breakdown about uh, what your career was like and, and uh, what brings you to the podcast? Sure. Um, Sergeant Major retired, Tim Turner. I uh, spent most of my career, as so all my career, in the uh, infantry with the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry and the stint in two commando, platform two, and the Skyhawks. Um, one of my specialties in the military has been uh, recce platoon and in the sniping world. As long with the military freefall world, uh, both Ben and I are military freefallers. So that kind of world kind of, it's a small world, so it kind of keeps you connected. And, uh, and, and presently right now, I'm with the Alberta Sheriff's Branch with the Executive Protection Unit uh, guarding the Premier of Alberta. Right on. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and Ben, uh, you know, if, for those of you that are just listening, um, they, they've got matching uh, jerseys on right now. And it's freaking awesome with a huge Alberta flag behind them. So, uh, Ben, uh, why don't you give us a lowdown on, um, you know, where you're coming from and uh, what brings you to the podcast? Uh, I'm Ben Click. And, yeah, we do shop at the same place. Uh, <laughs> I am a uh, retired army guy, uh, joined right out of high school, uh, same as Tim, went through the PPCLI, I uh, was lucky enough to spend seven years in the Airborne Regiment, uh, four of them with, oh, about three and a half with two commando, uh, and deployed uh, with Pathfinder Platoon to Somalia in 1992, uh, where I'd, uh, I was spoiled rotten, I was a, uh, in a sniper slot there, and uh, came back and Met up again with Tim in uh, the People's Alive Battle School. Uh, we'll talk about it later. We literally created our own job and uh, swanned around North America shooting sniper competitions uh, on the Queen's Dime and uh, teaching sniping and uh, moved on to uh, first battalion with a bunch of good guys, uh, Blake Ives and a handful of other dudes. And uh, we started up a sniper section there and deployed to Kosovo. Um, uh, retired after uh, just short of 20 years and uh, retired out of my second career where I'm now uh, I'm now on my own time teaching uh, long-range uh, shooting uh, including a lot of mindset stuff uh, to law enforcement military and civilians right on um, so guys the, the, you're now my third and fourth I guess snipers that I've ever talked to um, <laughs> in my career uh, the first uh, sniper I ever talked to um, because I was a reservist, right? So we don't really have uh, exposure to anybody at the battalion or, you know, in the sniper platoon. So, you know, when I deployed uh, the first individual I talked to, uh, he was uh, my roommate actually in, um, in Greece, uh, in Cyprus. And uh, it was just, it was cool because I never really had the chance to, to chat with anybody and just like cool, calm collectedness. I don't know if that's a, that's a, that's a trait amongst all snipers, but um, I think it'd be cool to, to just kind of get a, get an idea. What is it like to start the progress or start the process of uh, embarking um, into sniper school? And then, um, you know, what does it take to, to actually get to that level of proficiency? Uh, any of you guys can, can feel that yeah. one. Well, it's a long road. So first of all, you have to be regular force infantry. Um, we have had a couple of, we've had a couple of artillery guys, but they were in the food fact. So they got the, the mm. reconnaissance course, infantry reconnaissance course. And then they were tossed. So we thought, okay, this is going to be a big fail. But their mindset was outstanding. <clears throat> so they actually made it. So you have to also be communications qualified, reconnaissance qualified, and a marksman on all weapon systems, all small arms. Then you'll go to a selection process and we'll run a two-week selection. So we'll give them minimal lessons of how you achieve things with concealment, stocks, and all that good stuff. Shooting's easy. We can train a monkey to shoot. It's the other stuff, all observation and judging distance, all that good stuff. 
So when we put them on the selection course, uh, they we take the top candidates who really just you know achieved high levels and all those things we gave them. Once they get on the course, then it is a more detailed process. But I just want to jump back quickly about that mindset you said that the guy was calm and cool. No, snipers were all all levels. Uh, you get the, the crazy partier guys and the, the loud ones. It's not like <laughs> it's like uh, Dane from the first Seals movie, where it's just this you know yoga guy, and it's, it's not like that. Anyway, so I'll hand over to Ben. To the rest. Yeah, no, no, Tim's right. Um, I've seen a sniper platoon described as as uh, as granola. It's a bunch of fruits, nuts, and flakes. <laughs> it, it, it's that you know that that wide with that, that bandwidth of, of background but there is some some common traits uh, yeah yeah you, you know now that i'm out of it it's a lot easier to see uh hyper focused uh extremely high drive uh, and it's that ability to to mentally exclude and to focus not only in the moment but uh long term uh, I decided that I, I wanted a particular set of skills and and uh, a load, you know, particular load station. It took me seven years to get it, and that's pretty much what I lived for the entire time. And it, now that like all my instructors, uh, when I'm teaching, I, I bore out of the battalions, out of the sniper sections, and that's the one common trait is they have their long-term thinkers, uh, and they uh, they have that ability to to focus. And I think a lot of people in the sniper world, because one of our biggest uh, elements we do is observation. <clears throat> Shooting's like 10% of what we do. Observation's 90%. So I think a lot of people that come into sniping are observers to start with. So I'll give you the example. Ben was a sniper years before me, back in the black powder days, I think. And uh, he was he was qualified when he was in the commando. And I remember uh, watching Ben as a young troop. And when, when he was in the commando, he looked about 12 years old. And I'm like, what's up with this guy? Cause I'm watching him doing all these funky things. And he's like, Oh, well, Ben's a sniper. I'm like, Oh, okay. So I really didn't have any background on sniping just like anybody else other than watching a movie. So I watched this guy. I didn't even introduce myself to him. I just kind of like watched him preparing gear and doing things like that. I'm like, Oh, okay. That's, he's onto something here. And that was my only exposure to sniping was this guy until I got back to battalion i met blake ives who is like the god of sniping and the patricius and he just passed a couple years ago through a heart attack but uh yeah it, it, you talk about mindset and that that really is what it came, comes down to uh tim's absolutely right the, the physical skills of, of pressing a trigger and, and aiming is about 10 percent of shooting and 10 and shooting is about 10 percent of being a sniper but the underlying common traits of performance are, are the same, whether that performance is business. Um, uh, jiu-jitsu is a great way yeah. to learn it. Oh, you're, you're, um, he's a jiu-jitsu guy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm working on it. Uh, like anything else that's worth doing, you know, you get your ass handed to you on a regular basis, and it's incredibly humbling. Uh, I've been to competitions on the, on the civilian shooting side. Well, I was like, you know, like say 25 year old stud and two commando and I've had my ass handed to me by a 14 year old girl. Uh, she was just better prepared for that competition than I absolutely was. So it, it really does come down to mindset. We, mm -hmm. When I, you know, when I started sniping, it was, it was almost dead. Yeah, it was, it was almost completely dead in the, in the army. I think including the graduates of my course, we had about 18 snipers in the Canadian forces. So oh, wow. it, it was virtually dead. Uh, before I went on the course, they gave us a whole one day of, of pre-training and uh, this really cool old sergeant named Trapper Kane, uh, who's still involved with the, the advanced recce cell in Gagetown. Um, Trapper took us out to the range, made sure we could shoot our, our iron sighted C7s. And he gave me this, this one little kernel of knowledge. Uh, I didn't know it was called mental management. He didn't know, but, but it was. Uh, and it literally <clears throat> saved my ass on sniper course. About six weeks after that, it was, it was on the sniper course. And we're doing the uh, the range, the square range shooting tests, and there were there were six tests because back in the black powder days, we, we the C3 <laughs> did have did have iron sights on it, so we shot short range 200, 600, uh, long range uh, 700, 900, and night with the iron sights, and uh, which were incredibly accurate. And then we went over to the uh, the finest scope that 1952 could produce, uh, six power Hensoldt, um, and we shot the same course of fire. 
And I passed the long range and I passed the night, but I failed the short range. And you're only allowed to fail one of the six classes. You get one, one redo. So I signed my verbal warning for those who've done that process. Well, and mm -hmm. and uh, I went back out to shoot. So we get out there and I'm missing shots at two and 300. I am dropping points I should not be missing. So we get all the way back to 600 and uh, I'm at the make or break point. It literally is, comes down to the one round. And to my horror, it's a mover. <laughs> now, I, Tim knows anybody who's worked with me, like I am the anti hand eye coordination dude. Like my kids will <laughs> to this day over and hand me stuff rather than, than throw it to me. I mean, even the person, <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, Bobby Cottenham, our, our platoon warrant, comes around handing out live grenades, real grenades for the first time. You know, we trained with them, but real grenades overseas. And he hands two to like Pat and he hands two to, you know, another guy. And he comes to me, he looks me in the eyes, and he gives me this big sigh. He goes, because he's seen me throw and catch, right? He's like, okay, he gives me the grenades. But that, that's my, my, my skill with, with uh, you know, that's my, my natural inclination with anything that moves. So to my horror, I'm back on the 600 meter mounds on a break, make or break shot that's going to determine the rest of my career. And it's a mover. And for those who haven't been on a, a military range, there's kind of a cement trench, in this case, 600 meters away from you. And soldiers are down in that trench and they're holding a stick with a, with a cardboard target on it. And I'm lying there and, and I start, I do what Trapper told me, that one little kernel of knowledge. Um, and I lay there and I imagined those targets coming up and they kind of come up like a, like pickets on a fence and then they all move, they start moving because they're moving targets. And I imagine that happening. I imagine the shot firing and I imagine the hit uh, and I'm lying there with my eyes closed, imagining this and I open my eyes and it's a good thing because the targets have come up and they're now moving, moving across the range. And all of my rifle goes off, bang, like, what, what the hell? And just before they get to the end, mine starts to come down a little bit before the others do. And I'm like, I got ripped off. Like, that's not even a full exposure. The guy ripped me off. I didn't even get a full target. But I'm like, ah, okay, so I got to keep shooting. So I cycle the bolt, get ready to shoot again. And all the targets came up with mine. I'd hit it. I couldn't believe it. I'd actually hit it. So I'm like, yeah. And I look around like nobody else notices. Eh? Nobody else cares. <laughs> so at, at lunch, the, uh, the young soldier who was in the, in the box down in that cement trench uh, holding my target, he comes over and, and punches me in the shoulder because I hadn't hit the target. I hadn't hit the kill zone. I hit the two by two wooden stick Ooh. that he was holding and it hurt his hands. I'd hit a two inch stick at 600 meters while it was moving for a kid who got picked last for softball on the girls team. Uh, you know, <laughs> the point is that that one little kernel, that mental management, that, um, that mental focus trick that I was taught that skill or tool in the toolbox is what allowed me to go on and, and carry on. And as I progressed in my career, I, I learned other mental management or mental marksmanship uh, skills that I've applied in just about every mm -hmm. area of my life. Um, and it, yeah. it really, it, it's, it's all performance is 10% physical. Well, mm. it's, it's absolutely 90% mental. Yeah. Big time. <clears throat> and it's interesting that we didn't, that we don't really go into mental management in our basic infantry. And it's up to the individual instructor to do that. <clears throat> so I kind of feel bad that I didn't approach that because mental management is nothing new. That's been going on for thousands mm -hmm. of years. And the first exposure I had to mental management was when I was on the uh, King Forces Parachute Team, the Skyhawks, in 1990. <clears throat> so that's pretty early in the days when, when we were starting to get into really hardcore relative work and crew canopy relative work and all that good stuff. So it was relatively new to, to us. And we had these amazing uh, civilian instructors uh, helping us out. And they're all ex-Vietnam vets. We had a, mm -hmm. a, a phantom pilot from Vietnam and a Marine Corps gunnery sergeant from Vietnam. And these guys were big time skydivers. And as a matter of fact, they were, they actually did the free fall scene in the first Navy SEALs movie with Charlie Sheen. Oh, cool. So you know where they oh. did the free fall? Yeah. Those were the guys. No way. So anyways, <clears throat> we were introduced to mental management by these guys and, you know, you know, 26 year old uh, commando here. And I'm like, oh, this is lame. Cause you, they're like, okay, close your eyes, go through your jump, you know, you're dirt diving, you're doing the mental thing. But it was more than that, it was all the setup. And uh, after you did that, you were like, okay, yeah, this does work. So then on the way to altitude, 
you've got your eyes closed and you're going through your entire dive and emergency Absolutely. drills on the way up because it's like a 40 minute flight to altitude for a for a one minute free fall so the mental preparation for that one minute free fall is close to two hours wow that one minute one minute dive so in saying that then i took my sniper course uh, a lot later like 1990s 95 i think it was and so I used that stuff I learned in 1990 to help me on the sniper course. Because even the sniper course, we weren't really at no. that time using mental management. No. So I was doing it without realizing I was doing it. And as Ben said, on that course, the challenge on that course is you're all alpha dogs. So you're all guys who have topped courses. And you go on this course and you're failing everything all day, every day. So your mental mindset is dropping because you're like I've never failed anything before and you're 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 saying like eight eight things a day eight evaluations a day of fail and you're like oh my god what am I doing here um so you just gotta really you gotta focus out that negative and it's so hard because I was depressed when I I passed three of us passed the course out of 14 and I didn't feel worthy to be a sniper because you failed yeah, so too. much throughout yeah right and then I, I, I'm like, oh, congratulations, you passed sniper course. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, thanks. You know, <laughs> I felt really bad. And it was only um, a year later, we teamed up, went to the international sniper competition and won it. That's when I went, okay, I think I'm worthy of that hmm. qualification. I was not going into that competition. No, I felt good because we trained. And I'll let Ben hit on that. We trained our asses off and we did unconventional stuff like, um, and we, we would go into the indoor range with 22 calibers and just do all positions and shoot really small targets. Marksmanship is marksmanship. doesn't matter what caliber. And I'll, I'll hand it over to Ben for how we prepped for that. Yeah, actually, we were really lucky in that we had a lot of support from the school at the time, uh, from troops to time. You know, we didn't have to go off and teach other leadership courses or recruit courses. We, yeah. we focused on this, this first brand new, uh, inaugural Canadian International Sniper Competition. Uh, and basically, you know, we, we talked about how we created our own job. Uh, <laughs> yeah. we, this kind of started there is because we needed a place to sit uh, to, you know, to order trucks and order troops and, and find ammo and decide which range we're going to use. Um, and, and it kind of went from there. Uh, but to prepare for the competition, we can't just sit there and say, you know, uh, oh, we're winners, you know. I look good. I feel good. And by golly, people like people me. like I'm the best sniper <laughs> in the world. You know, it's. I don't it, think our younger it, listeners will know that reference. <laughs> yeah, no, it's you can't. Old Saturday night, old Saturday night live. Old yeah. SNL, love like, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't, you, you can't just like talk yourself into peak performance. There yeah. has to be some substance behind it. Uh, we won that competition because we were better prepared. And after you've done a few of these, uh, you realize that. Uh, there's about the top 5% of performers, any one of them could win the competition. It'll tend to be the same top 5%. If you look at the Olympics, it's the same top 5% that win 90% of the medals. You think of uh, medals, you think of like Michael Phelps with like 13 gold medals, right? Uh, Lance Armstrong with all, oh, never mind. Oh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> I've got the exact uh. ticket. Here to force win Lance Armstrong, woo! Yes. Um, but quite seriously, it's the same people. Um, we would just have to be better prepared that time. We went out and uh, we broke down the skills into individual small digestible chunks, just like we learned to teach in the military. And we said, well, what do we need to do to be able to do this? Well, what do we need to do to support that? And then we worked on those fundamentals and mastery is just a deeper understanding of the fundamentals. It's not what we know. Shooting a rifle, for example, is four things, but it's how well we know them. Like I haven't got my, my black belt in jujitsu yet, but I, I, I've seen the guys who do. And the day they get their black belt, they teach them the very first throw you learn on day one, Ogoshi. And, and that's to reinforce the idea that, that mastery is simply the fundamentals understood deeper. Right. Everything we do on sniper course, you do on TQ3 basic infantry training. You stock on, on, on both courses, but you go into much greater depth on basic sniper. You shoot on both courses, you learn observation, you do some judging distance, but you go into much greater depth on the more advanced course. So that's, that's one of the principles is, is um, 
is mastery is just the fundamentals understood deeper. And by being better trained, uh, by, by being better prepared, pardon me, focusing on the fundamentals, uh, that allowed us to go down there. And in the end, uh, it was really our ability to, to do some very basic tasks that allowed us to <clears throat> consistently, it was, it was pretty much, by about halfway, we had a pretty consistent lead. And we just maintained that by just sticking to the fundamentals. But I think, I think the why we did is the training that we uh, designed um, was every shot counted. <clears throat> we weren't just making empty casings, right? And every bad shot, we totally debriefed why we didn't make that shot. So when we went out to that competition, I really felt like, I know I was, and Ben had to be, because he's the master of the mental side, is we were in a true bubble. Like I literally, in, in my mindset, I took everybody out of the equation. So I wasn't like, oh my God, I'm competing against these guys. These guys are seals and blah, 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 right? I just tuned it all out. So when we were in our shooting position, I had everything tuned out and I'm sure Ben did. That's yep. why we we're so effective. And uh, one comment we did have, we won the, the uh, multiple engagement shoot, oh, yeah. which is a combination of the spotter has the C8 shooter got the, the sniper. So there's a couple of different things that a lot of things that go on. You have to judge distance. You have to find the targets, judge the distance of the targets and then communicate. The debrief we got at the end of that was, wow, your sniper communication was dialed in. Yeah, I think we did that whole shoot in six minutes, and I yep. think the fastest team after us was 10. And we took all the targets. Too. And we killed every target. Yep. So I think our prep that we did prior to going is what made us succeed there and everywhere yep. else. And on our final shot, I was totally in that zone. Yep. He was in that zone. We got into that OP, and when we shot, uh, let that last shot go, and he heard that ding. Um, we just basically looked at each other like, yeah. didn't even say a word. We just looked at each other and went, yeah, got it. And the nice thing is, is the two teams that could have caught us, they really couldn't have, but they had to have shot the smallest target first at long range to gain the extra points before they shot the secondary target. So they're in the back. They can hear the ding. Mm. They're like, oh, shit, those guys hit. We don't know what they did. They hit the large first, small or small and then large. Right. right? So we made the calculation of, well, if we hit the small and the large, we've won for sure. And the nice thing about hitting the small target at about five something was at least we got some good data to hit okay. it. So we can hit that long instead of going for the long and going for the gamble. And it worked out. So it was yeah. great. And uh, the first thing he said, because <laughs> uh, he's humble, is uh, after the Van News went through and missed, they shot and there was nothing. We just let, we won. Yeah. Um, I'm just like, yeah, that's good. And he goes, oh, because that's shitty to win that way. But, hey, we made the least mistakes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely true. Yeah, the winner is the person who makes the, the least mistakes, the second last mistake. Uh, there's, two, there's two points that Tim, Tim is illustrating so well there is. We focused on process, not results. Yeah. Because mm. I can't control the target. I can't control how well the other teams are shooting. Uh, but I can focus on my process. So we focus on process, not results. And the, the, the idea that, that Tim was talking about there is at the end, we go, yeah, we won. We didn't care about that. We, we don't care about results until after. Then we, I mean, we care who wins. It's, oh, it's a bunch after, of A-type assholes. You know, we're, we're pretty focused. You know, we're, like, nobody, was, is there, nobody is there to come second. He was pretty stoic when that happened. And I'm like ready to like, Ugh! see, because that we're just humans. So it doesn't matter. The sniper isn't just that calm guy, right? Right. But he's like, ah, so I'm like, oh, shit, I got to contain this. And then when we finally got to the uh, presentation awards, then this guy's all jacked. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, then I'm like, like okay, I can release this. I can be excited now. <laughs> I'm happy. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah. so, so, guys, um, so from what I understand, like our snipers, obviously, including yourselves, um, are world class and have been for a very long time. Um, and, you know, case in point, like, you know, uh, Rob Furlong had the, the longest KIA. I don't know if he still does. Um, I don't know if anybody surpassed that. Longest with the 50. Yeah. Longest with the 50. Okay. Longer shots with a couple other uh, high powered rifles. But uh, okay. what, what's remarkable about Rob's uh, shot was they were, they were using substandard ammunition. 
Um, and they were under uh, some pretty, pretty, from a shooting point of view, some awesome conditions because the air was clear and light and the, uh, you know, and bright. But um, they're at altitude and, at altitude and high and, angles. And using not Canadian ammunition. Uh, so there was, oh. uh, you know, we, we talk about sniping or any good performance is a little bit science and a little bit art. Uh, and a little bit of luck. And, and a lot of luck. Yep, absolutely. What we do is we focus on our process um, so that we can increase the likelihood of, good, of a good performance. And right. we, we hope for some luck to come on our side. And Rob's a great example of that. They not only used the science of, of the ballistics that they knew, but they trusted their intuition. When their first round didn't hit, they didn't panic and break it all down into, into numbers and try and rebuild it. They said, hmm, a little bit left. And they trust their intuition because all our intuition is, and it's, 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 you know, much too girly to say intuition, but our gut feeling is much, much more acceptable. But all our intuition is, it's our subconscious mind, which is all of our experiences combined, screaming at us to do something. Mm -hmm. So whether it's eh, hold a little bit left or hmm, maybe I shouldn't get it on that elevator. I don't trust that guy. Mm -hmm. That's our intuition. That's our subconscious telling That's us what no to fear. do. That's the no fear no. example. Yeah. yeah there's a, a book called K N O W, not N O. No fear. So it's that spidey sense is real. If you're feeling it, something's up. Yeah. Same thing with that yeah. with shooting. Yeah. Right. That's then, um, that's Tony Blower. I don't know if you're, yes. you're referencing him, but Tony that's... Blower just actually has a new new book out on that. Yeah. Yeah. Right on his podcast is, is no fear. It's a, it's an awesome podcast. And, uh, you know, I've, I, I've had the, I guess the awesome opportunity to, to do one of his seminars here in Montreal too. And I just love his stuff and just his like situational awareness and like yep. making sure that again, you know, fear and like, don't, don't push down that, Hey, maybe I shouldn't be getting money from that bank. Uh, yep, uh, exactly. you know, machine that's outside. It's dark. There's somebody, your, your subconscious is telling you. And, uh, I was, I just interviewed, uh, shoot, who was it? I can't remember if it was, um, Dr. Parsley or, um, one of my other part, uh, podcast guests, you know, in ancient times, you would have somebody that would have a gut feeling and everybody would stop, be like, what is it? What are you feeling right now? It's like, I don't know. I think it's, there's something in the woods over there and everybody in the tribe would be like, check, let's, let's check it out because yeah. there's something that is telling you whether it's the rustling in the trees or it's the wind or it's the smell, you can't put your finger on it, but that is critically important to your survival. And we've just learned to like push that down for whatever reason. We're, we're animals, right? And that's our primal instincts. So that's our survivability right yeah. there. We try to use our big brain to over, it's called conscious override. Um, we try and override what our subconscious knows and our subconscious knows it's the sum total of our whole life's experience, but we try and override that with what we decide that we know better. Um, I got to shoot a few years on a, on competitive rifle team shooting uh, C7 iron sight and, and, and scope. And uh, there, there's a difficult shoot called the nade and you'd run from 300 to 200 and little, little figure 12, a little tiny target would pop up and down like a popsicle stick and you have to fire a couple rounds and, I was okay at it the first year. It's instead of 15, I was shooting like a 45. And it, yeah, it's, it's not a disaster, but you're not gonna win anything with a 45, right? So we go, you know, end of the shooting year, we go away, do soldier stuff for, for a number of months. And we, we come back in the spring and we're gonna shoot the rifle team again. And first day, we're gonna shoot a few matches. We shoot this Naden again. And I run down from 300 to 200. And you, you, you go from the kneeling to the, standing to the kneeling before you fire. And so it's kind of a dynamic moving shoot. And, and, and for again, for the softball boy, it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit tough, but I, I get into it. I fire the first couple shots. I'm like, oh, I felt pretty good. And I stand back up, kneel back down, fire the next couple shots. Oh, I felt pretty good. And I fire my 10 shots and the target comes up. I got a 49. I've never shot a 49. I'm like, oh, that's awesome, man. If I just tighten my left knee up, if I just lean harder into the magazine, I'm going to get a 50. Oh, because now I'm focusing on results, right? And I'm trying to do it. As hard as I can, well, 42, 39, because I was trying to consciously override it, where if I just lay back, put the conscious mind aside and allowed the subconscious to flow through and do the skills that I know I have, that's my peak performance. And that's really what mental management is all about, whether it's uh, shooting, parachuting, business, relationships. Uh, it's really about taking our conscious mind, setting aside and allowing the, the intuition or our subconscious mm -hmm. to flow through. And going all in. Yeah. And so that we can perform on demand and under pressure, you know, like you can, you can, 
you can do anything when you're, you know, calm and by yourself and, and, and nothing rides on it. But when it's the moment like that, that shoot, uh, that Tim described the, the spotter shoot, uh, sniper shoot, there were five metal plates, um, and it was make or break. That was the time to win or lose. And as Tim described, we used what's called the image of exclusion, that idea that there's nothing else in the world. You know, very famous sniper, Carlos Hathcock, talked about forming a bubble. Other guys talk about closing themselves in a box. Um, for those who watched the Coyote Roadrunner uh, show, you remember the desert scenes? There's like these finger, ridiculously tall cartoonish mesas. I imagine myself up on one of those and my target's on another one and there's literally nothing else in the world. And that's the image of exclusion I used at that moment when I had to shoot those five plates with an iron sighted C8. Um, I just lay back, forgot the rest of the world, used my fundamentals and focused on the tip of the foresight, not on winning or losing. I, didn't, I can't control that, I didn't worry about that. I focused only on the one thing I control and that's the tip of the foresight and then trusted my intuition that, hey, winds changed, hold left. And that's what happened. And so it just works. So the bubble is really important and something I've been pushing for years even before I became a sniper is my concept of ops with the bubble is if I just have a two man team, we just gonna need to worry about our bubble that's around us. If we're a four man team, a company, doesn't matter. And <clears throat> when we did that final shot, that was the first time I was fully in my bubble where I had everything awesome out, everything out, because I knew this was for the win. So the next time, <clears throat> you know, I, I can get that bubble going when I'm concentrating on uh, other tasks but it's not a hundred percent. That was a hundred percent. And <clears throat> the next time I had that hundred percent was my first uh, firefight in Afghanistan. Then I was in that bubble. So I was in my defensive bubble of awareness around me. And then I had a secondary bubble around all the people that were fighting around me. So that, that's hard to describe, but I think um, that feeling I had <clears throat> after, the, after that action, I thought about that sniper shot at the competition. And I'm like, that was the same feeling I had. But I actually had more bubble. Like I said, I had a second layer of bubble of other people around me because I had more people. Whereas yeah. <clears throat> in that OP, I had Ben. So that was just, just that bubble. It was totally silent. Um, yeah, the only thing I remember is our communication. And then, ding, boom. And that's what woke me out of that. So yeah, the concentration has to be high. You have to, and to get into that bubble, I think you have to be all in. That's the big thing. You have to buy into it. And you have to be all in, and and you can't think about it. It just happens. Mm. Yeah, and what, you know, I use I use slightly different word. It's the exact same thing. And a lot of this mental management is stuff that you do in your life that other people do, uh, but they may not do all of the the aspects. They may not do have, be using all of the tools, uh, or they may not be using them consciously. All that mental management is is just giving them a name. You know. Uh -huh. acknowledging them and doing them consciously. Um, Tim talks about uh, being all in. Uh, I will verbalize it as be all there. Like <clears throat> there has never been a couple loving each other more than, than Tim and his wife, Karen. They're amazing. But when Tim is in front of his troops, when he's with the premier, when he's skydiving, when he's shooting, there is nothing else in the world. He, he's not thinking about Karen. And just as importantly, when, when he's with Karen, he's not thinking about skydiving or shooting or the premier. It's all there. And I don't know if, if, if you meet a lot of people that you feel like they're important, but then every now and again, maybe a half dozen times in my life, I've met truly great people who make me feel like I'm important. Because when they're with me, um, one of them was, it was a premier's chief of staff. That guy's literally a premier's chief of staff in the middle of an election. And he was with me as a student for, for a day. And he did not talk about, think about, check his phone once. About six hours in, I said, when's the last time you thought about work? He goes, I haven't. He was all there for six hours. You know, I worked with, I was fortunate to work with a couple of Canadian generals and same deal. Uh, that, that guy had a lot on his plate, but when he was sitting there, eye contact with you, he was 110% there. So the concept is to be all there, as Tim mm -hmm. puts it even better, uh, you know, all in. It's fascinating that 
you know, everything you guys are talking about here, um, you know, they apply to, you know, elite sports teams, you know, you talk about the process and you're talking about, you know, visualizing and being there in the moment. And, you know, if you want to call it flow or whatever, you know, the word has been attached to it, it's, it's, it's all, it's all very similar. And, And same with business too. It's, it's getting into that, that mental, focus that you call it the bubble um but to not be distracted to have that phone away to be present is is so 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 important and it's really cool to hear that that's the same process that you guys have uh learned and, and applied to you know the 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 nth degree and it's gotten you guys incredible results um so like obviously this is something that you, it was a it was a process right in in itself for you to learn um would you say that like your your background like growing up like before you joined the military was was an important factor or is it really like the the military culture that had or and the, the training that had such a massive impact on you and that's what makes our snipers you know that cut above is that is that it does that sound well, i right? think i think everybody's experience is different and for me um my upbringing wasn't the greatest and i had to kind of make things happen for myself so I was 14 and I found a shooting club and I'm like, Hey, I want to join this. So my parents signed the form, but I had to go make money, take the bus, get to the range and, and be taught by these, this beautiful old Swiss couple. Oh, really? uh, yeah. Three Fair position uh, indoor range. They are by athletes and they were amazing. And they would, you know, you know, all right, do this, do that. You know? And, and then they started into mental preparation, which I didn't realize what it was at the time. And that's where I got addicted to shooting. So I just made that happen. Anyways, so my upbringing, I made things happen. So it wasn't taught to me by parents. And I knew at 12 years old, I wanted to be a paratrooper. That's what it, in my, that's true. Yeah. In my mind. Yeah. Yeah. I meet people like, especially kids of today. Well, I mean, it's all generations really. And they're in university. Like they're in university taking courses. Go, I, I don't know what I want to do. I knew what I wanted to do when I was 12. And I kept my eye on the prize and became a paratrooper when I was 17. You know, so does the, the upbringing bring you into that? I don't think so. It could maybe, maybe my crappy upbringing made me that way. I don't know. But my son is a sniper as well. We're the only father son snipers came for his history while serving. So I don't know if it was my upbringing with him that got him to there or was it him? I, I think it was him because everything he's achieved, he's achieved better than I've than I have. Right. Right on. Um, yeah, that's, that's super interesting. Like, uh, everybody that kind of has that, uh, hyper driven, hyper focused motivation and that achieves great success. They've already thought about it in their minds, whether it's at a young age and, you know, I'll use my best friend. Like, uh, he wanted to be a cop from the time he was like 14. And he was one of the youngest, he was one of the youngest cops on the auto police force right. because he decided he's like, no, I'm gonna be a cop. And we're like, you want to be a cop? That's okay. I, I didn't think that was going to be a thing, but he visualized it. And that's like, no, that's the only thing I'm going to do. Um, so yeah, he became a cop. And it's, it's funny. You mentioned that, you know, I want to be a paratrooper. Um, and it's the same, like, if you listen to Jocko Willing, same things like I want to be a Navy SEAL, like I want to be a commando. Like it's, it's just having that, that visualization that ends up manifesting itself in reality. It's, it's crazy powerful. Uh, I only started doing it recently because, you know, like I, I, I used the example of uh, Michael Jordan uh, back in the days. I love basketball. He would visualize every shot, like before a game, he'd be in this bubble. Yeah. And he'd be practicing Absolutely. just in his mind. And for him, there was no, there was nothing else other than becoming pro and being the best. And so he just constantly visualized it. And it's amazing. Like, obviously you need to put in the practice. You can't just say, right. Hey, I want to be an astronaut. And uh, how come I'm not an astronaut yet? But yeah. it's, it's incredible to think like that, it, that we have that ability to just visualize, execute, and then, you know, uh, sooner or later, if you're dedicated, you'll, you, you'll get there. And so Tim, uh, what, th- that's really cool. Like I, I saw it on Instagram, um, you know, your, your, your son's handle, I think is, uh, John Utah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I'm Angelo and- Pappas. So we're the characters from Point Break. From Point Break. Yeah, right. The original Point Break. Okay. Night. It's great skydiving right. movies. So we've, we've adopted those. But I just want to say, when, it, when you know what you want to do when you're a kid, uh, Ben's son, oldest son, Jack. Huh, um, you know, I, I remember seeing Jack when he was this big. And the next time I saw him, uh, we're at a mess function, and he's a police cadet, regimental sergeant oh. major. And he came to me, he goes, hey, Tim. I'm like, 
goes, Jack. I'm like, holy crap. And he knew what he wanted to do. And now he's a cop. And he's like, dad, you know, he looks like he's 12 years old. And his first <laughs> arrest, the guy's looking at him and Jack's like, yeah, this is happening. <laughs> right. So Jack knew what he wanted to do as well when he was young. Absolutely. We, we talk about, uh, you're talking about future forecasts and the power of perseverance. Uh, the future forecast is just simply acting and, and forming your life in every aspect of your life as if what you want is already happening. Uh, it's not a question. And, and Jack's a great example of that. When he was like nine or 10, he's like, dad, I want a dog. I'm like, no, I'm gone all the time. And we have three kids. No. And he's like, dad, I, I want a dog. No. He goes, dad, when we get a dog? No, not when, if. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I've already accepted the if. Well, we didn't get a dog. We got two dogs. Okay. It, it, it just continually, he talked about dogs. He wrote school stories about dogs. He went out and bought stuff for a dog. He laid an area out in the house where the dog was going to be. And he sped his life. He focused his life on as if we already had it. Interestingly enough, oh. one of my students is the senior executive chef for a major restaurant chain. And they have a, uh, a concept called Joey's 2023. It's Joey's restaurant. And Jason, he says their concept is we act as if the things we want to happen in our restaurant chain are already happening. So they run a restaurant the same way that we operated to become snipers, the same way my 12 year old son wanted a dog. And when my son was about 14, 13, 14, he decided he wanted to be a cop. He read cop books. He did cop jujitsu. He thousands of repetitions of dry firing in the basement. Watched, I made sure that he got good cop books. I made sure that he had excellent uh, retired police mentors. His part-time job was working for Phil and Diane at PD Enterprises, as a gun store. He's the only child I've seen working in a gun store. But he was being mentored by, by child ex never. <laughs> an, an ex-cop. Um, and the only reason they didn't pick him up at 18 is they wanted him to finish his university. They picked him up at 19. Um, and that's the power of perseverance. And, and I just want to add, because I, I love Jack, I, I feel like he's my, uh, my son as yeah. well. And uh, As far as we know, that's not true. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the cool thing, uh, what just sparked my thought was uh, him saying Jack wanted a dog. Jack wanted a dog. What's he want to do in the, in the place? He wants yeah. to be a dog man. <laughs> he's a dog. He's so actually got his own Malinois now. Yeah. And he's, yeah, he's hoping to some working towards, he's working, to, he's patterning his life to become a canine uh, police officer. Um, and, and the program is amazing. Yeah. They um, have to volunteer 800 hours with the dogs before they can be considered to go to the dog team. Yeah. It's amazing. You know, so he's, you know, he, he's a carbine operator. So he, uh, he spends his off days when he's not being a cop, he spends his off days uh, being a, a volunteer with the canine program. And he's out there riding with the canine cops with his carbine and, and running with them. Um, so the point is that, that he has that, that trait of success, one of those predictors of success Focus. of, of patterning his life, of future forecasting and pretending what he wants is already happening. Yeah. Check. Uh, um, future for Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, that, that, that's very similar to Carol Dweck's, um, work about, you know, rather than, you know, you mentioned like, if we get a dog, it's, it's patterning. Um, uh, and this was big in, um, when I was a teacher, you know, a kid is having trouble with, you know, arithmetic or some math problem. And it's like, oh, I'll never get it. I'm not good in math. And you say, well, you know, like when you get it, then you'll, you'll think differently. And it, it's, it's just changing. It, it seems simple, but it's it just patterning, you know, the, the possibility that, you know, you will eventually get it. So rather than saying like, I can't, it's, well, when, and so it just, it just, it's a simple mind shift, but it's something that I've applied. I mean, for time and time again, since I, I started embracing that kind of philosophy is that if you want something, you got to accept the fact that it's already done. It's a fetical plea. Like you're, it's going to happen. It's just, you gotta, you gotta change the, the, the words you use, because if you use the words that are negative and that are going to impact you negatively, then it just, it's that kind of vicious circle. You don't get it, but you want to get into that yeah. virtuous cycle, right? Yeah. Very cool. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the subconscious mind, which is the power of everything we do, it moves towards whatever the conscious mind is, is picturing. Mm -hmm. I talk about if I, if I took a two by 12 and laid it on the floor and had you walk along it, you'd probably be able to do that. If I take that, that same two by 12 and I put it 40 feet in the air, yeah. it becomes a more challenging task. Not because it's a more challenging task, because we stop thinking about walking on the two by 12. And what do we start thinking about? Falling. Falling. 
And when the minute we start thinking about falling, our con subconscious mind just like, oh, okay, well, let's get ready to fall. And people start to <clears throat> crouch and they waver. So we focus on the, the downside rather than focusing on the task. Um, it's, we have to focus on, on what we want. The, the biggest predictor when I see a bunch of, you know, like 25 guys getting ready for, I still get, they, they drag me out like the old dude to go and validate all the young snipers. Like, oh, oh, you're so much better than we were. Oh, validate, validate, validate. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm watching these guys doing the, the pre-sniper course and I'm kind of walking around them, just listening to them, talking to them. And it, it is still the same now, 30 years later, um, when we were running selection for sniper courses back in the 80s and 90s, when we were running selections Pathfinder course, um, which has a really high attrition rate too, uh, everybody's the same from the neck down. Like they're all fit, young, strong guys. But the biggest difference, of course, is mental. It's from the neck up. And well, there's a you know a great variety of people, and there's a, there's a whole wide range of, of mental tools in the toolbox that are going to predict success. The single biggest thing that I'm looking for is what it's the thing that determines success. The, the, the most is what the person believes about themselves. Yep. If and it's exactly what you're talking about. If you think that you can build warfighter online coaching, you can, you're right. And if you think, Oh, I'm never going to get math. Yeah, you're probably right. Unless you have a professional yep. intervene and, and change that and say when you get it. Like, so with math, it's interesting that you say that and being teacher background, I was terrible at math in school. And I, my daughter's a principal. And <clears throat> for me, I find teachers in school do, do not know how to teach. They don't make it interesting. They don't teach like how we do in the army where there's lots of practice. There's lots of questions. It's done in stages. There's confirmation. There's no confirmation until you do the final test in school. There's a couple of quizzes and that's about it. So anyways, I'm like math. Oh, I don't get it. This is dumb. I got math. When I joined the infantry, when we started doing advanced machine gunning and you're doing indirect fire stuff and you actually got to calculate fire missions. And I'm like, oh, now I'm, this is easy. <laughs> then when you go on sniper, there's a crap load of math. And I, because uh, this is what I want to do, it, it, it's easy. So it all comes down to how it's taught, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, hands down. Like when I went from, yeah, I was, uh, you know, I learned how to teach as an instructor in the army. I didn't learn how to teach in teacher's college. I'll be, I'll be totally honest. I, oh, you, you know, I got a bunch of philosophy. And you, you watch the other teacher, but they don't teach you to teach. Yeah. And it was just, it was so frustrating because, you know, you got it, you're bound by curriculum and, and whatnot. So the amount of practical application is, is very, very limited. Um, and, you know, a case in point, like what we learned, we learned the worm rule, right? When you're doing like indirect fire and it's like, that's just trigonometry. But when you call it the worm rule, a bunch of dumb infantry soldiers like ourselves can just be like, oh, okay, I got this. We but don't work. I, yeah, he's like, this will work. I got the worm rule. Yeah, no shit. I got it. You know, like, and then uh, you, I can apply it to, you know, my 12 year old, 13 year old students yes. or I just call yeah. it the worm rule. And they're like, oh, okay. I'm like, you guys are doing trigonometry. Like, this is, this is awesome. Like you guys don't realize it, but this is literally what we do. And if you just change the context and you make it just a little bit more approachable. And like you said, like practice and just the, 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 the fundamentals are just like how to, how to actually uh, send a message to somebody so that it's, it's ingrained and that you practice it until it's, 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 it's not even a question of whether or not you understand. It's just like, how many reps do you get in? Um, so that it's ingrained deep into that, that gray matter. That's the, that, that, that's well, it's the, definitely the, the mental mindset, matter of teaching. Right. It's, yeah. it's the mental mindset of it. And you've got to make it interesting for your students. And I find school doesn't, again, my, my son wasn't the smartest guy in school, but then he achieved all these hard, courses, you know, like parachute instructor and free fall instructor and all this good stuff and sniping and the sniper deck commander course. Uh, I mean, it takes a and, lot to learn this. And, and Tim's left out the, the, probably the most mentally challenging one, which is search and rescue technician that, that, yeah. uh, that Nick is. That's, that's high volumes of incredibly technical and incredibly high risk and high outcome, not just for him, but for other people. That's a ton of very technical information. But because the prize is worth the price for him, that we made it interesting for him. But taught then well. it was value and well but taught uh, by 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 making it worth it his time. Uh, then it became a value. Like my, my kids, I, I taught them trigonometry uh, at home by doing off angle shooting. High angle shooting, forty five up and down, is just a cosine of the the range. It's the uh, 
it's the horizontal component of, of the vector. But that horizontal component of a vector, yeah, real interesting. Okay, well, you got to hit a target at 900 or 15 degrees uh, positive. You know, what's your cosine? Then it makes sense, then it's a value. Now my uh, now my daughter, daughter's like the leading, yeah. <laughs> she's like the leading mathematician in the world. No, my, 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 my daughter's <laughs> a theoretical mathematician, and we joke about one of her uh, instructors, one of her professors right now, um, was talking to her about trig, and, and she, yeah, she explained, yeah, my dad's a sniper, and he taught us with that. He goes, oh, he's Russian, eh? Ex-Soviet, he goes, oh, in Soviet army, I was an um, officer of rockets. You know, and he literally was like shooting scud, uh, uh, Russian scuds uh, using the math that he has. So he was a rocket scientist. He's literally a rocket scientist. <laughs> literally, yeah. yeah. So, you know, it, it, the practical applications of making something worth the, the, the price somebody's going to pay. Uh, the founder, like the, the originator of, of mental management, talks about his son, typical teenager, Dad, can you buy me a car? Sure. Um, I'm just going to have to put your mom out to work and sell the house and we'll get your car. He's like, well, that's that, no, don't do that, dad. Well, why not? Well, it's not worth it. Okay. Well, how about you go out and get a job, work for six months, but in the meantime, so you can get your job, I will loan you some money to buy a car, but you have to work for it to earn the car. Okay. Cause then the prize is worth the price. Selling your home, put your mom out to work. That's not worth it. So, but doing it <laughs> something worth the price, then it, it has some value. And that's an interesting story because that's, uh, I didn't even know about that story. And that's what I do with my son. So we were posting Wainwright together and yeah, it was great posting. I got to post yeah. my son. Oh, yeah. And uh, anyways, all his friends were rich farmer kids and mom and dad buy them a car at 16 and then they smash it because they have no ownership. They didn't earn this car. So they don't give a shit. Right. So Nick's like, hey, uh, you know, we you know, be able to get me a car. Well, yeah, we could afford a car, but I, you're not going to own this car. So I said, well, you go to work and uh you save up and we'll see what we can do we'll, we'll chip in some money so he worked at 14 all the way to 16. he was focused we didn't even have to chip in and he bought a brand new honda civic at 16 years well, old I didn't know that. cool and he would not let any of his friends ride in this because he owned <laughs> that car so what, what's our takeaway you need to earn things not be given things right because if you're right. given things was, you, you have no ownership and it's like ah i, I can afford to have that yeah. rot away or get smashed Ro yeah robert yeah. heinlein talks about it in the uh the, not the world's worst movie starship troopers but the world's best book starship Troopers. amazing book amazing yeah. book yeah colonel du dubois talks about the the value of things he, he gives one of his students in uh, his moral philosophy course you know uh, a pretend gold medal he says well here's a gold medal are, are you proud well no well, why i didn't earn it okay so you came third in the track meet you proud of that yes because you earned it. So our prize has got to have its price. Yeah. And once we pay that price, we not only motivated to getting it, uh, but then we actually value the thing we have, whether it's, you know, starting your own humble, small business of a corner store, uh, raising a successful family, uh, or any achieve, you know, the less important achievements of, of, uh, of our career. Uh, the stuff that really matters has little to do with, with airplanes and guns and, and submarines, it, it's, it's to do with the people who are around us. And it's those successful uh, relationships that we have, whether it's business or family, that, that really matter. And the stuff that is used to be enable us to hit targets or fall out of airplanes is the same stuff that, that we apply uh, in our relationships with other people. Yeah, that's you a know, good point. Be all there, future forecast. Man, if you see that you're a young guy and you see that girl, if you don't think, oh, I can't wait till I'm hanging out with her, you know, you're never going to go up and talk to her. Right. You know, I did. Uh, and the sacrifices we make for our family is one of the reasons that, that makes it so worthwhile. So the same things that we're doing at work um, to achieve our, our so far so-called important goals are the same processes and the same thought processes and mindset we have to have uh, when, when dealing with families and the ones that we actually care about. So it's funny you mentioned. Uh, it's funny you mentioned. Uh... Hey, I want to, I want to start hanging out with that girl. Uh, that was like literally me and my wife. Uh, I, man, I was on pre-training. So I'd come back home from Valcartier. Uh, I was living in Montreal and uh, I'd go to the same pub every Sunday to have a so-so breakfast, but to be served by my wife, my future wife. And in my head, <laughs> I, I went from, I, I didn't go for like a week. I went for like four months and I just lingered and I, in my head, I was like, oh man, I can't wait till we're hanging out. Like I didn't even talk to her. I was just like, yeah, I'll have some more coffee. Yeah, I'll have the regular. 
and but it was just constantly in the back of my mind like hey this is going to be great when we're hanging out right before i go on tour or yeah. come back from tour and i had this whole vision in my mind and we have you know two beautiful kids and live in a gorgeous house and it's just like whoa i was like I, I'm, it's scary how uh, this can just manifest itself and just take on a whole new uh, life. She revisioned it. And it happened, right? So when you were when executed, did. did you think about it? Question for you. Did you think about those good times in the future while you're away doing shitty stuff on tour? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's absolutely. That, that, that's the only way you get there. Uh, that that's another version of future forecast yeah. is that's what, there's a book uh, called the, uh, the Meaning of Life, and it's it's written by a uh, I believe it was a music oh, Monty teacher. Python. No, 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 that's the movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now there's some philosophy. <laughs> Try to explain Monty Python without doing the voices. I dare you. Um, <laughs> but in, in the book Meaning of Life, uh, I can't remember his last name. Victor. He was a uh, uh, before the Second World War. He was a Jewish music teacher, I think, and he he survived through Auschwitz. And one of the mental things that they would do while they were being worked to death digging ditches was him and this other guy would talk about uh, fancy dinners and they would actually in real time imagine fancy dinners and going to the opera and spending time with their families who are now dead. Uh, they future forecast that and that's what got them through that tough time. Uh, another, another guy you should talk to is called Kevin Whitenet. Uh, he was one of the plank owners for JTF2, uh, works with Baden K9 now and the Navy SEAL Foundation. And Kevin and I were sitting on the, in the final um, uh, DZRV rendezvous point on the, what we thought we believed to be the last day of the Pathfinder course. <laughs> and we're freaking starving. Like you, you're in caloric deficit the whole time. And it, it's just, there's no magic to being a Pathfinder. You just have to be really, really good at suffering. That's, that's all it is. And one of the skills of being really good at suffering and, and having that endurance through tough times is that future forecast. So Kevin and I are sitting up to our waist in the swamp and I catch his eye across the triangular patrol base guys all staying, trying to stay conscious in a, in a swamp. And, and Kevin sort of gives me the sup chin and I'm like, and I, no, oh, he did the pizza. I did the, the Roma burger. And we, we, we mind eating this delicious, massive burger. And he comes back with the pizza and we pretend we laugh like hell. And that got us through that day on to the next day. And it turns out that, that that ability to imagine good times in the future is what kind of drags us through the, the rough times. And it's probably one of the most valuable skills for dealing with difficulty that, I, that, I've, that I've come across. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's in, yeah, that's incredible. I mean, um, you know, I, I wasn't really uh, sure like where we'd go in this conversation. Um, but, you know, talking about this mindset stuff, I, you know, like I'm, a, I'm, I'm a full on like adopter now. And that's, that's basically that like, of all the stuff that I read now, um, whether it's related to business or it, it doesn't matter because as a human being, no matter what you want to accomplish, uh, you know, I, I use the 80, 20 rule, essentially for everything. Um, you know, if I want to be successful in my business, 80% of it's mindset. Um, you Absolutely. know, if, if I'm not, if I'm not convinced that, like you said, <laughs> that I can do programming and I can do it well, I'm, I'm not going to do it well. And you know, if, if I'm not convinced that, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm going to have a really successful family and I'm going to move on and, and you know, my kids are going to do great and it's not going to happen. And it's just, it's reinforced more and more and more. And especially talking to guys uh, like yourself that have that, you know, high end elite experience. And you're talking about the same things that I'm reading about and I'm experiencing. Uh, it's a really powerful message. It's huge. So my job as executive protection, it's so mentally draining. Because when you're on, you're on. You're on and scanning and uh, getting the atmospherics of everything. You're all there. Observing. Yeah. So the interesting thing is it was it was really good transition job because it's basically like being in recce platoon where it's no sleep. Like we work 16, 18 hour days, maybe one meal a day. Never know when you can go to the washroom. It's just miserable. Yeah, it's cool. I get to travel all around the world and stay in five-star hotels for about five hours because we're working the whole time. But it's interesting when I bring in new guys, bring in ad hocs, and I'm the team leader watching these guys, and they're not all in. Because I can see in their mind, they're, this is a cool job. Yeah, it's a cool no, it's job, not. but you gotta be on, right? So they'll come off the mission and they'll be all like, oh, that was really good. Okay, then I'm really, I'm the army guy harshness, because in, in that world, you can't really be too harsh because people's feelings get hurt. But the guys that come to this unit, they're all dialed in alphas that are would be great army guys, great infantry guys. 
And then you just got to dress them down. It's like, no, you weren't all in, man. I can see you like smiling. You, you don't smile. You got to have that face on. And when you have that face on, you're really observing and watching the room and using your observation skills. You got to be on and checking all your arcs at all times. It's draining as hell. And then you get these guys who aren't all in. <clears throat> and the nice thing about our new system that we have with ad hocs, we, we put them on course and we go, you know what, Ben did a great job. I'm going to consider him. So out of the course of 15, I might pick five that we're going to work with. Then we bring those five in at different times. And I go, well, you know what, Ben didn't really work out. He was awesome on course, but then on a real 18 hour mission, not a, a yeah. two hour yeah. tour uh, practice, he's dying. So it's like, we're not calling you again. Next. So it's a good system. And exec protection is a huge um, skill set that is all in just like sniping or skydiving or base jumping. You have to just be there at all times. You have to be engaged mentally and it's draining. And even so if we're doing our executing our full mission, um, you know, say it's a big uh, rally going on, whatever. That's the mission. Then when we're moving from point A to point B, I say we're providing that security. We're moving to the next thing. So we'll say we're just moving to supper. Well, that's the principal's downtime. That's not our downtime. So even at supper, we're on. So there's, there's never a break. So you've got to have that. And that ties me into what you're saying about the forecasting the future. You have to, you have to have that as well to get you through that day. Cause on, the 18th hour of the ninth day deployed to DC or New York. It's like, Oh, I just need to get back to that hotel room and, you know, have a shower, order something, some food. So you just think about that, take a quick pause back in the game. Right. It's that gets you through. It's like, Oh my God, I don't know if I can take another four hours of this. Right. It's, you just got to be in and, and, and totally, it's not convincing yourself. What's the word? word I'm no, it's, it's, it's just focusing your mindset uh, yeah. and, and giving yourself the, the mental support that you need, yeah. you know, and uh, going with that support is, is uh, I'll throw a huge shout out to one of the other predictors uh, of success is, is the power of the pack. It's mm. the people you hang out with. Yes. You know, you become like the, the five people you hang out with the most. Like I, when I'm a new kid in two commando and they, there's these dudes like Tim and they've all been there longer, you know, they've, they've been there longer than I have. Uh, and I'm watching them and like, I'm like, Oh, look at that guy. That guy's checked out. And then like 10 years later, I'm back in the battalion and I see this guy's I'm like, wow, he's a piece of garbage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, the fact is he was a good soldier because he was surrounded by good soldiers and he was brought up to that level. And it's the same when I went to Pathfinder platoon, I was solidly in the bottom half of that platoon, man. Like I was, I, after three or four years in, in two commando, I was pretty squared away. I was like one of the old dudes, been there longer than just about everybody. I knew what everything happened and blah, blah, blah. I go to Pathfinder platoon. I'm like, wow, <laughs> these guys are amazing. But I became a better soldier <laughs> by being around them. Yeah. So I don't hang out with people like me. I try and hang out with people that I want to be like. And I also hang out with people who want to be like me. Or they want to be like the people. They want to be like the people they think I am. Not really, but it makes because they expect me to be a certain way. That makes me be the best person I can. So I have I have um, you know students who come to me and they have this image of like oh this I try and be that for them because it makes me better at what I do mm -hmm. and it makes them better at what I do. But the biggest the biggest support I want to throw a shout out, shout out to one common thing that we have is we both have amazing wives yeah. and there's no way that we could have achieved anything that we have or had the opportunities we've had if we didn't have them, not just supporting us, you know, standing behind us. Uh, I don't want somebody to stand behind me. My wife stands beside me. <laughs> Karen kicks his ass on a regular basis too um, and brings us back and keeps us focused and reminds us about the stuff that we're supposed to be doing. Uh, and without that, you know, the, we talk about mental management of these wonderful people, Lanny Basham, Keith Cunningham, you know, your, your, your old uh, Swiss couple or the, yeah. the civvies, they're great. But the people who live that reality day in, in and day out with us, who we choose to, to be with uh, our spouses, that is the short of, short of coming to, to your faith. That is the single most important decision we make in our life. 90% of our happiness or 90% of our unhappiness is going to come from who we, you know, who we stand beside. 
both in our marriage and in, in our, our larger relationships. I, I hang out with Tim because I want to be like Tim. There's aspects of him that I absolutely admire. Incredible leader, you know, a solid husband and father. Always talks positive, and I love that. And I want to be like that, so I hang with it. And then I, you know, I practice that with my wife. We try and talk positive about things as much as we can. So, you know, who you choose to be around in your in your second bubble, yep. and who you choose to be around in your in your first bubble is probably the most important. And that's uh, big. I think it's just, you know, some simplistically wise is cut the negative people out. Yep. Right. And <clears throat> you do see those people and it's like, I want to be like that leader. He's amazing. But his personal life is just shit. Yeah. So maybe I don't want to be like that. Right. But I find that all these positive people that I base my leadership style on, they've all become super successful people. And I've started reconnecting with those people. Um, my, my, fault is I like the underdog and I have a lot of friends who yeah. aren't doing well and I, I'm, I'm always there trying to coach and help and and then you get to a point after a couple of years it's like I can't help this person and it's draining me yep it's not good for my mental state so I cut away and you gotta you gotta make that um that decision and it's a hard decision because I'm like ah, I'm almost there but no that person's like when you see someone every single time you see him say, Hey, how are you going? Ben's like, Oh, I had a shit day today. It's like every single time, like, come on, man. Like it's not no such thing as having a shit day every day. And if it is a shit day, be positive about it. Take, take something positive out of that day. Embrace the suck. Yes. Yeah. Joke so, about it. Um, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's a difficult thing to do to step away from people. And it, the hardest person to step away is, from is ourselves. And one of the things I'm 53 and one of the things I see a lot of my friends dealing with is stuff that I've dealt with just a few short years ago. And that's um, moving on to the next phase of our life. Mm, right. So my, like I coach my son, Jack, I'm like, when he wanted to be a cop, I said, okay, future forecast, you already are a cop, but you're just in your pre-hire phase. Yeah. Now you're in your recruit phase. Now you're in your rookie phase. Now he's been like five years in. You know, you're your seasoned cop going on into specialties. Later on, you're going to be a cop leader. You're going to be a cop instructor. And eventually, for all of us, we come to a point where we're no longer the, the active duty guy. We move on. I hate the term retired because all we're doing on is moving into a different phase. So I was the warrior recruit, the warrior uh, operator, the warrior whatever. Then you become a warrior leader, which has many facets, mentor, that kind of stuff. And eventually we come to a phase where we're no longer active duty. We're not face shooting bad guys at 25 anymore. We're, we're 50 and it's time to step away, not down, but step away from that. And you become warrior businessman, you know, warfighter coach. I think this is Ben's way of telling me to retire. Yeah. I've been working on it for <laughs> I mean, a while. I've been a gunfire <laughs> since 1756 yeah. now and still but, on the pointy end of the stick. Yeah. But it's but, killing me. It is killing me. But, 25 year old Tim can't do the stuff that 25 year old Tim could do anymore. But 20, just more importantly, 25 year old Tim cannot even come close to the things that Sergeant Major Tim can. We can get, we can get 25 year old studs or fit and face shoot people and got the right mindset. We can get those, but the lifetime of experience to move on into that phase of warrior mentor, warrior leader, warrior coach, warrior healer, uh, warrior historian, whatever, whatever your heart desires. Actually, yeah. whatever you wanted to do when you were 12, that's probably, that's the best advice I've ever had at this age of life is whatever grabbed your heart at 12 years old, whatever you wanted to do, go do that or teach other people to do it. But I have to that, that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm yeah. Out of plane yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and you know, that's important too, yeah. is to continue to, to free fall. So you oh, know, I hang out with, with young 25 yeah. year old snipers and master snipers and, and, and that makes me better. So, so we, uh, so I, I, I jump continuously and, uh, he's most jumping guys, right now, most guys, uh, <laughs> pick up golfing. I take up base jumping, you know, at, at my age, a couple of years ago, wow. fucking, I, uh, I liked it, but I, I think that's when I started getting sarcoidosis cause I was so tired at the end of the day. Yeah. It was like 18 hour days and five climbs up the cliff to, to jump a day. And, uh, it killed me. Anyways, where was I going with this? Um, probably talk oh, about how you got free fall. Yeah. So, you know, he sees me free falling. So I said, fuck, I want to come out and do that. So he brought his uh, son, Liam and daughter Anna out and all three of them came and jumped. And I went up in the plane and jumped with them. 
and it was just cool to see like having the whole family out there and seeing the reactions. And it was cool seeing Ben's reaction because he hasn't jumped since like three, four days. Plus years, yeah. And now he, he tells me a couple of weeks ago, he goes, you know what? I want to start this again. So yeah. this, this spring, he's going to start uh, free falling again. Yeah, absolutely. Right on. And right on. Tim talks about actually a good mindset point was, was my son and daughter. Like, I'm like, oh, this could be cool. They're going to be so scared. This is going to be so, it'll be a good, like oh, breaking yeah. through fear part. And then they were awesome. They were like totally calm, totally chill about it. Like, you know, uh, Karen asked Anna, um, so how are you feeling? She goes, it's no big deal. You get out of the plane shoot opens gravity does its work she was totally mentally prepared so was yeah. liam to Liam, like i've got the video of the both and i mean they're focused they're present they're totally 100 percent there they're switched on you know i can see them visualizing their drills in the aircraft and stuff doing their job but there's no real deep fear my kids know fear with a k like the book says do you remember back in the in you know 10 years ago in the 80s um uh, <laughs> there's there that that slogan no fear to like no, no fear, no like, fear to deny fear. oh yeah High yeah, school, it's huge. Ridiculous. You're falling out of an airplane. That's ridiculous. Of course there's fear. So my kids have been taught, and it was, that jump was a good, their first jump was a good example of that, is they allow that fear to come to them. They accept it. It washes over them, and then it passes. I tell them, my wife put it very well. Fear is like, we were in the, in the ocean down in, uh, down in Oregon, or Washington, and we were standing on the beach, and the waves were coming. She says, fear is like a wave. It comes to you in this powerful wave, but when it hits the shore, it breaks and loses its power. And it was just a cool metaphor. And I saw it in my kids. Like, yeah, they were afraid, but they accepted that fear. They knew that fear, accepted it, looked at it, let it wash over them, and carried on. They didn't try and deny it and push it down. They just kind of let it happen and then carried on with what had to be done. It was, it was a really cool, uh, real cool parenting moment, a real cool mental management moment, too. So Very cool. Very we should cool. go here and embrace it. Yeah. Absolutely. The, the closest thing that uh, I, I can uh, relate to uh, with my son, he's only four. Well, he's turning four in the two weeks. Um, he's Wait, six. So. Free fall qualified then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he's, I'll, have to, I'll, have, I'll have to hit you guys up because that's, that's the one thing that scares the shit out of me is heights. Uh, I did my basic mountain course and like I, I, I was like, okay, I got to learn how to climb and I, I got to I like accept this fear of mine and overcome it. But the thought of jumping out of a perfectly well-functioning airplane is just that thing that just like it ties my stomach up and then so how did you do on the climbing what, what what did you think um i just like you said that bubble where and like we're, we were doing you know like night repels with all our gear on i can't see the bottom like i i just for me everything in the military i felt like that that security like i trusted my instructors i trusted my gear um same thing on tour like i i trusted who i was patrolling with and once you have that trust it's that fear just kind of washes away. I don't want to sound like a hero. It wasn't like I wasn't scared on patrol, but I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't death gripping my rifle. I wasn't in a no. panic. I was you actually kind of excited. Thing. No, you know why? Because training works. Yep. And I'll give a good Absolutely. example. Like, you know, <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to have, you know, like a couple of other missions under my belt before going to Afghanistan. So I've been, had rounds shot at me before not a full firefight by harassing fire. So I know what that feels like. So we go into Afghanistan in 06 and I got troops who just came out of recruit training and a year later they do their workup training and here we are in Afghanistan. First, first firefight, everybody's doing their job. Why? Training works. Yeah. So we've prepped these guys and their mental ability adapted into life just like that because the inoculation training we did worked. Yeah. What, what you, you know, it's, the, it, it's, it's a tired old platitude that what you do in training, you'll do in war. Uh, but it's also absolutely true. Uh, one of the last things I did before uh, I left a battalion and went into a desk job was uh, teach a course that I decided to add some pistol into. So they did hundreds of repetitions of, of presenting a pistol in a draw. And to get them to mentally and visually focus on the front side, I had them verbalize it. So there's all these dudes in front side, front side draw after draw front side front side well five years later i run into one of these guys in, in canadian tire and uh he's like hey man and he tells me the story uh they were in a wadi in afghanistan in the middle of the night you know if you've ever patrolled in the middle of the night you know it's you got this machine gun strapped to you and you like bonk into the front of you, guy in front of you and you curse him and then somebody bonks into him from behind it's you know it's a general clusterfuck so he's standing in the the uh in the wadi and he's got this C6 strapped to his chest. He's rather, you know, big rucksack as, as typical. And he's kind of encumbered. And this dude pops out of nowhere 
about 10 feet to his right in the middle of the night. So he claws at his, his pistol and he draws it out and some poor farmer had some Canadian soldier stuffing a pistol in his face yelling, front sight! Because it's exactly what he'd done hundreds of times. And on demand, <laughs> awesome. under pressure, he did exactly what he trained. The poor Afghan farmer didn't know what the Canadian was saying, but he knew his intent uh, because he defaulted to his lowest level of training in an aggressive manner and yelled front sight. So the point is that what we do in training and our quality of repetitions yeah. is exactly what we're going to do on demand and under pressure. And it takes you same as the, the jump course. The basic jump course is probably the best course Cane Forces ever offers because it's about safety. You do things wrong, you die. So the repetition, repetition, repetition. And you could take any jumper that hasn't jumped in 10 to 20 years, guaranteed he knows all his aircraft drill and he knows all his emergency procedures because it's just hammered into you. Because what do we do on the jump course? Every, everything that goes on, you repeat, right? Get ready. Everyone's on it. When you're in the flight racks, it's just, you're just massive repetition in that flight rack and it's painful. And yes, you're getting uh, beasted if you do things wrong. So you don't do things wrong anymore. Right. Like I said, anyone who's been out of the jumping game for 10 to 20 years, they'll be able to do all the drills. Yeah, we practice not until we can get it right, but until we cannot get it wrong. Right. It's, it's that concept of, yeah, practice makes permanent. Not perfect, makes it permanent. Right. And it's the same thing with free fall. Well, like that. Free fall is even more uh, advanced and uh, consequences. Um, you know, you have 13 low speed malfunctions and three high speed malfunctions, whereas in static line you have one and one, a full speed and a partial. So putting all those reps into you, uh, is just natural. It will never go away. Right. Right. It's like, um, I guess the closest thing I, I have is I've been out for a while now. I've been out, but she's the last time I touched a C7, I was out in 2016, but like, honestly, like the last time I really, I was on the range in like 2012. Yeah. And then last year, um, I went on the range, um, with a buddy of mine. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just one of those things like drills are drills for a reason. Yeah. yeah. It does it, 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 you can be gone for decades and you see those like old school jumpers from the second world war. I got a kick out of it and they did that yeah. jump in France. I'm sure all their drills, same thing. Like there's no, there's no fade. There's no skill fade because it's permanent. There, that's been hardwired so that you can never get that wrong. And that, that practice makes permanent. I got from uh, Kelly Storette. Um, that's and, awesome. um, yeah, I, I really embrace that. Um, once I heard that, I was like, yeah, that makes a lot more sense. A practice makes perfect yeah. because... That's a honest. really good point, too, about the rifle. Because, again, you could be a guy who hasn't been on a rifle in years. Or if you're seeing file footage of news and you see guys with guns in the background, you go, you can see the way he's indexing and holding that grip. He's had that training. Yeah, he's training shooting. It's, it's put into you. Yeah, yeah I think that's exactly. With any real high, high-level skill thing you do. It eventually becomes subconscious. I was on the range yesterday with... with mm -hmm. uh, uh, Frank, one of my one of my students, has been with me a while, and he's to the point now where the rifle just goes off. He's firing shots subconsciously. Uh, as soon as his subconscious recognizes that his body's in the proper position, that the sight picture is correct, it automatically fires the rifle, and he hits exactly where it's aiming. So he has practiced until he cannot get it wrong, and it's a subconscious skill. Mm -hmm. And he's trained his mind to allow the subconscious to flow through like that, and it's uh, his performance has just gone gone crazy he's hitting everything now it's amazing it's awesome. beauty um tim and uh everything that we discussed today is just it's just gold like it, it it's just filling up the treasure chest uh of of knowledge and and um uh, you know just by your experience and 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 sharing it with the community um you know the whole point of me kind of doing this podcast was to get as many voices on as possible because in my opinion especially uh you know being members of canadian Armed forces i don't think we talk enough about our experiences um and we don't share the the common knowledge that is really 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 valuable so i really appreciate you guys sitting down and, and sharing your experience with uh, with the community because i think it's going to go a really long way especially with the new generation of uh, guys and girls that are coming into the forces or you know police or whatever it may be uh, you know like i've got plenty of listeners that are not in the 
uh, law enforcement and, and military, but just the mindset uh, is, is a huge, huge, huge game changer. And if it can get a little kernel of, of just yeah. understanding from this, um, it can really take them a long way. So again, guys, I really appreciate you guys sitting down and chatting. So uh, before I, uh, you know, we, we go and uh, do our own things for the rest of the day. Um, uh, Tim, I'll start with you. Uh, where can, uh, if uh, somebody wants to reach out to you, uh, where's that, where's the easiest thing or easiest place to, to reach can, uh, out to? Get you? me two places, my hotmail. And my hotmail is Sergeant major at hotmail.ca and it's SGT for Sergeant short form. And my Instagram is army underscore Sergeant underscore major. Awesome. Ben. Uh, I'm usually in a van down by the river. But, no, <laughs> another uh, epic SNL reference that anybody yeah, that, under the age of 35, no idea. <laughs> oh, dude, like, when we're in the old folks home, handwriting is going to be our secret code because none of the staff are going to be old enough to read ah, handwriting. Yeah, <laughs> cursive writing? Like, uh, yeah. what is this hieroglyphics you're writing, sir? Yeah. Yeah. I don't understand. How do I swipe right? <laughs> um, no, uh, <laughs> easiest way to find me is either on, on uh, Crackbook, on, on Facebook, uh, Sierra 64 Rifle Craft is the name of my, uh, my shooting. Uh, business or simply on uh, the world's worst website that I've got to improve on. It's like me to improve my website uh, is Sierra64.com. So S I E R R A number six, number four.com. And that'll, uh, that's got a, a contact page. You can contact me there. And if there's anything mental management, uh, shooting related, um, anything I can do to help people, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, there's very little that, that is original to, to me or, or, or anything I teach, uh, it's all, I owe it all to everyone uh, that takes the opportunity to teach, including thank you, like yourself, who's out there spreading, uh, spreading information and, and contributing into everybody else's life. Uh, so if there's anything I can do to help, uh, please feel free to contact me and I'll do, if I don't know the answer, I'll either make it up or I'll find somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. <laughs> Awesome. Um, yeah. So we'll, what we'll do is we'll just make sure that uh, those are all in the show notes there so that uh, people can get a hold of you if they, if they're looking to, to contact some, um, some well-experienced and uh, just down to earth, uh, good old Canadian boys um, hanging out in Alberta. So uh, <laughs> gents uh, really appreciate you sitting down again and uh, can't wait to uh, touch base and see how you guys progress, uh, especially on Instagram. Sergeant major love the feed. It's awesome. Yeah, you um, and yeah. <laughs> uh, you got some really good stuff on there so and you can tell by the amount of followers so you're really hitting a nerve there so um again uh many thanks and all the best and uh take care guys be well yeah, you too thank, thank you for what you do man appreciate it keep it up peace what well